it's my great pleasure to welcome Caroline Uhler. Caroline is faculty at ETH Zurich and at MIT. She does very exciting work in machine learning, genomics, and statistics. She's uh, from her background a mathematician who worked on algebraic statistics and did a PhD in statistics at, at UC Berkeley. And then over the last few years, she moved into more applied fields like um, genomics and machine learning and is studying very exciting problems there. So her work uh, addresses problems such as graphical model learning, causal inference, autoencoders, and in computational biology questions such as the spatial organization of, of DNA and um, multimodal data integration, which we'll learn about more in a few minutes. Caroline is a star in the field. She has won numerous awards like an NSF Career Award, a Sloan Research Fellowship, and a Simon's uh, Investigator in the Mathematical Modeling of Living Systems Award. We are very happy to have her here and to learn more about her current work. Thank you, Caroline. We are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Karsten, for this introduction and for having me here. Um, so let me just get started um, and start with some motivation for this talk. So as Karsten said, you know, we have been very, very excited and interested in problems related to data integration and multi-domain data integration. And, you know, here I, I mainly work on applications to biology, but I also wanted to make clear that, you know, the same kinds of questions arise in many, many different areas. Um, so if we start with the biological kinds of applications, um, I'm excited by questions in single cell biology because, you know, I'm interested in how is the packing of the DNA related to gene regulation. And so then, of course, you have, you know, nowadays what is exciting is that you can actually observe the cell in all of its or in many different kinds of um, with many different kinds of um, data modalities, which will tell you different things about the cell. So, for example, you can take images of cells. Um, you know, and, and highlight uh, many of the different features that you see here. At the same time, of course, at the single cell level, you can nowadays um, take RNA-seq uh, profiles, the very high throughput um, chip-seq, attack-seq, et cetera, et cetera, right? That, that all give you other different kinds of um, insights into cells. Um, but one of the big um, problems or challenges in single cell biology is still that, you know, many of these data modalities or acquiring this data um, is highly destructive to the cell. Um, so it's still very, very difficult to do, you know, to get different modalities in the same cell, right? So, for example, if you if you get an RNA seq profile, then you have to fix. Uh, then you, your cell is going to be destroyed, right? If you get an image and you're fixing the cell again, again, um, your cell is going to be destroyed. Um, so you don't get the same different kinds of modalities in the same cell. And what you can do, of course, is you have a population of cells, um, and then some of them you take out for imaging, some of them you take out for sequencing. But it's not the same cell, right? So you have to infer kind of or <laughs> in order to understand how, you know, for example, the packing of the DNA, which you can measure very well as in a DAPI stained image, how that relates to gene expression, you really have to infer somehow which, what would the, the image have looked like? Were I able to image it also based on the RNA-seq profile and also the other way around? But very similar questions, of course, arise in all kinds of other um, applications, right? So for example, you may want to integrate and translate between audio and video um, in order to get better spatial correspondence for object detection, or, you know, you have different kinds of data modalities like video, radar, leader, etc., that you want to integrate and also translate in order to compensate for missing or corrupted data. So those are the kinds of questions um, in terms of multi-domain data integration and translation on the observational data side that, uh, that I've become very interested in. Um, but then, of course, what is super exciting, I think, um, in terms of um, biology and genomics is this um, opportunity that you can actually perform really, really large scale interventional screens. Um, and this has become possible um, through the CRISPR um, system, right, where nowadays you can actually intervene on, on cells at the very at the single cell level again to get single cell RNA-seq profiles and really know which gene got actually knocked out or perturbed um, in the screen at the single cell level. Um, 
So that's super exciting. At the same time, there are all these huge drug screens. Um, and so, but also here, right, the, the problem that the cell um, is destroyed by these, by these um, observations is again a problem because really what I would like to be able to say is, you know, how would the cell have looked like before the intervention, right, when I measure it after the intervention or the other way around, right, but I can still not do both because getting the measurement means destroying the cell. Similarly, you know, often you maybe have a drug screen, right, that looks at many different cell types, but and this is something that we'll be talking about um, now comes, you know, this disease, um, which is, you know, COVID-19, right, which affects particular cell types very much. And now the question is, you know, can you infer from these drug screens that have already been performed on some cell types? Can you now infer, well, what would these drugs do on this, um, you know, diseased other cell type um, that you have not yet really measured, right? Uh, or have not yet tested all these drugs on? You can, of course, get some data from this particular cell type, but, you know, you probably don't want to go through all these drugs again and test all of these again. And of course, similar questions arise, you know, of course, also in many other areas, right, where you can nowadays actually perform interventional um, experiments. Um, you know, if you think of A-B testing in um, the advertisement, right, personalized ads, if you think of online education, which actually makes, um, you know, performing interventions much, much easier, or also in manufacturing, etc. So everywhere there you have like observational data, interventional data, you would like to integrate these all um, or translate between them or, you know, translate between before intervention, after intervention to really be able to figure out the causal effects. Um, so this is a bit of a high level overview. And um, now what I want to do is actually give you four specific applications that have motivated um, what I will then be presenting in terms of machine learning um, methods. Um, so these are the four applications, and you'll see they're all in the same flavor as I presented before. So these transport uh, problems or, you know, uh, transfer or translation, um, you know, they all have like different kinds of names and different kinds of areas. Um, so the first one is the one where I want to transport between different data modalities that I mentioned, okay? So here is the, the real application that I care about. It's kind of like what I said before. Um, so you have a population of cells. I can take out some of them um, for imaging. These are DAPI stained images um, of the cell nucleus. So here you see the packing of the DNA. And I can take out some of them for um, sequencing. So here I have single cell RNA-seq data. There is no paired data um, for imaging and sequencing at this level. Um, and so now, because I know that they come from the same population of cells, I would really like to be able to learn the map. That can bring me from RNA-seq to images or the other way around from images to RNA-seq. Okay, I would like to be able to answer the question, hey, you give me a particular RNA-seq profile, how would that cell have looked like? Were I also able to image it? Or you give me a particular image, how would this cell have looked like? Were I also able to get its RNA-seq profile? Right? Only that will actually tell me something about the biology of like, how are these two things actually related with each other? Okay, so that's the first um, problem that we want to discuss. Um, the next and second one is very, very related. Again, it comes up because um, getting these images is highly destructive to the cell. Um, so in particular, if you think of these images that need fixing of the cell, it means that I can never get access to the standard time series data sets, right? Because once I get this image, then this, the cell is destroyed and I cannot see it. In particular, I cannot see it over long processes, say, for example, um, you know, cancer progression, right? inside the body, for example, you can anyways not get that, even if you can get some, you know, short progressions. Um, so then what do I want to be able to do? Well, again, I can pay, take some population of cell at time point one and the population of cells at time point two, right? And, you know, from time point one, I take out some cells from imaging, then I let them progress throughout the next time points. At time point two, I take out some other cells for imaging, right? Again, they're not the same cells. Um, so here I have a representation of the population at time point one and a representation of the, the population at time point two. And what I would really like to be able to answer is how would this particular cell have looked like at time point one or the other way around, right? Again, I cannot get to see this um, between these two different time points, right? I really need to infer this. Um, and of course, we'll also have to talk about how do we actually validate these kinds of methods, um, which we will. 
So very similar question. Again, I hope I can actually infer this function, right? Because I know it is at the same population of cells that is um, progressing over time. So obviously something should in fact um, be remaining there, right? But I really want to be able to do this at the single cell level because, you know, for example, I mean, here really I'm motivated by um, cancer early detection problems where, you know, I have these cells here and I really want to be able to tell how have they looked like at earlier time points. Would I have been able to already then detect um, that they are on a path um, to becoming cancerous? Um, I really in the end want to be able to do something like um, inferring cell lineages, etc. although I don't have access to them. Okay, so that's the next question. So all of this are uh, at the observational level. Of course, you can ask these things also with RNA-seq data or any data set that you care about. So then um, I come to the interventional setting, um, which I mentioned also on the previous slide. And here, um, I'm particularly motivated, and you'll see it by the SARS-CoV-2 application, but, you know, um, where I want to infer, you know, how these drugs um, would have affected a different cell type that I don't get to see. But here, you know, I can also ask the same question in terms of mice and humans. So say, you know, and obviously this is something a pharma industry would really love to be able to do, right? I have here, I'm measuring the expression in mice of, you know, all of these different drugs and, and some controls. And, you know, and humans, of course, have access to the expression uh, of, in controls and different kinds of cell types. And I would like to infer what all these different drugs are doing. Okay, so again, you can think that, you know, something like this should be possible, right? Because I do have here controls and controls and hopefully I can learn enough about this map and learn enough about, you know, what these drugs actually do, right? As compared to the controls so that I can really fill up this, this little square here. Okay, so this is another transport um, question where I want to transport now, it's a causal question, right? I want to transport the effect of a particular drug or particular um, intervention um, to a different environment, which in this case is humans. Or, you know, maybe more realistic, a different cell type, uh, which is how we're going to use this. Okay, and then comes the last problem. and and. Um, I mean, at least to me, this last problem is actually very different than the others. And we are at least solving it in a very different way than all the other problems, um, just because we don't know yet, in fact, how to put it into the same framework. But I'm, of course, very interested in any of you have ideas on how to do this. Um, so this is a problem that occurs. And again, it's in the interventional setting. And here we're thinking about um, uh, gene knockouts. Um, so when you, and nowadays, you know, gene knockouts, I mean, there are libraries to knock out um, any of the genes you like, right? But of course, humans have 20,000 genes and you don't want to and cannot, um, in terms of, you know, how many experiments it, it requires, cannot go in and, and uh, knock out any combination of genes, right? So that's a huge number and, you know, certainly not now possible and probably will not be possible just because this number is so huge. Um, so what you really want to and what, what has been done um, is, you know, I get actually already a whole lot um, of, of different kinds of knockouts. Um, you know, I knock out, for example, gene A, I knock out gene B, I knock out gene C and D, I knock out gene E, etc. Right, so this is all of the data that you get to see. And of course, you have controls and you have all of these different knockouts. And what I would like to be able to do is now, of course, I don't get to see all of the others, right? I would really love to be able to predict the different kind of knockout that I have not seen. Okay, so from all of these that I have seen, well, can I predict what knocking out gene F will do or what knocking out gene H, I, and A will do? Okay, so I have a whole lot of data over here. And I really want to fill in this kind of table here where I have all these other combinations um, of knockouts that I have not yet seen. Okay. Um, to us, this is a very different problem because somehow, you know, um, you're trying to predict a different kind of distribution, right? This interventional distribution is different than anything you have seen here. Um, of course, also here, you know, the distributions are different, but you know, they at least come from um, the same environment, for example, or, you know, they come over time, etc. But here, it seems like in order to figure out how the distribution shift actually goes, right, you really need to understand something about the underlying gene regulatory network, this underlying causal graph here that you have. Because only if you know this can you try to figure out, well, if I intervene on a different node, um, what is actually going to happen and what way is the distribution going to shift? 
Um, so here we're really taking a graphical models approach, you know, inferring this causal network here. And then from there being able to say like, hey, you know, because I now inferred this causal graph, well, and now you tell me you're going to knock out gene F and I know gene F is here. Well, then I can predict what actually happens, you know, when you knock out this particular gene. Here. Okay. So that's um, kind of the overview. These are the four questions that I want to talk about. Um, and we will see that, you know, all of these three questions are actually solved in this, I mean, in, they all have different kinds of methods in the end, but they're all building up very, very heavily on autoencoders. So I'll spend a lot of the time um, in this talk talking about autoencoders. Um, because we use them so heavily in our research, we spent um, quite a bit of time in terms of actually trying to understand the theory and, and why they work, when they work, how they work. Um, so that's um, what I want to talk about here. Um, and then also, but what I'll start off with so that I leave, you know, most of the time for these applications and for autoencoders, I thought I'll still start off with um, just graphical models, um, also because I'll get back to this application in the end where I'm going to use all of these things um, together um, in the SARS-CoV-2 application that I mentioned. Okay, so I'll start off with this last one here. Um, and then move on to, you know, all of these other problems um, that have autoencoders as their backbone. But you see that they all sound like kind of similar, right? But, but I think they are actually really quite different in terms of, you know, here working with interventions. Whether you want to um, predict a uh, different, so transport between interventions, so predict the effect of a different intervention, it seems very, very different than when you want to transport the effect of a given intervention from, you know, one environment to another say from mouse to humans, from one cell type to another, etc. Okay, so although they sound different, all, it sounds similar, all these transport problems, they, they can actually be quite different in nature in the end. Okay, so I'll start here, um, just because, uh, you know, as Karsten said, we've spent a lot of time in recent years um, working, I mean, actually in, in the last maybe 10 years or so, working on um, graphical models and causal inference, um, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so where are we in terms of causal inference and how do you actually learn gene regulatory networks when all you have is RNA-seq data? Um, so that's data on the nodes and you would like to learn a network on um, a network that connects all of these nodes and is causal in the sense that it can tell me what, what happens if I knock out a particular gene. This network will actually tell me what, which, genes, which, which expression of genes will actually change. Now, of course, causality is such an old field, right? that it obviously has a long history. It's such an important uh, field of asking, you know, why does something happen? Um, and so the framework we're using is a one that was um, proposed and introduced by Sewell Wright in the 1920s uh, to study heredity um, in, you know, different kinds of species. So he really introduced um, diagrams, these, these networks, these directed graphs to represent causal relationships, which in, in his applications were heredity. Um, so because they're causal, obviously there are no directed cycles, right? And we can talk about, you know, I mean, there are nowadays extensions um, to also allowing directed cycles. I'm going to use this one here um, in, in this lecture. So no directed cycles because of course causality can only go forward in time. Um, and then of course, if you think of gene expression, right? Uh, so these are noisy. Um, this, is, this is not deterministic, um, so I have every node is a random variable, and um, what this causal graph represents is a very simple, actually, um, kind of model. It's that every node, which is a random variable, is some function of its direct parents and noise. Okay, so for example, X4 here is a function, um, of course, not necessarily linear or anything like that, right, as in gene regulation. Um, of its direct parents, so in this case x2 and x3, and some noise, again, not necessarily Gaussian, right, because, um, of course, if you look at um, gene expression data, and particular single cell is certainly not Gaussian. Okay, so that's the model, but now, of course, I don't get to see the network, right? All I get to see is observations here on the nodes. So observations on what are these gene expression levels, and humans, this will be a network of 20,000 nodes. And now I would like to infer this network. And now it is, you know, and this has been done um, 
the XGL to already go down. So, you know, the earlier work has in particular been in the observational setting and is very clear that it is very hard to learn causal graphs in, in the purely observational setting, right? In general, not identify the full graph. We'll have that also on the next slide. Um, and, you know, the problem also, if you, even if you have latent variables, et cetera, it's just very, very hard to say anything causal if you just have observational data. So that's why what I'm super excited about is that in, in the genomics context, you actually do get a huge amount of interventional data, right? This gene um, knockout data is interventional data, and that can really, really help you to um, get to the causality, to the underlying causality. And that's somehow the new question, right? That has not been available before. And so, you know, this work didn't have to think about um, interventions and how to deal with interventional data. So that's, I think, what is the really exciting opportunity is that we have interventions um, and we can think about them. Um, so in particular, we have knockout interventions. Um, those are the most invasive ones. Those are hard interventions in the sense that, you know, you go in, you choose a node, and you just set it to a value, in this case, zero, right? And a knockout, I'm just going to set the node um, to zero. So that means I'm actually changing graph structure, right? If you go out and you cho choose a node and set it to zero, then, you know, in this case, X1 has no more effect on X2. So I'm actually changing the graph structure. Um, and then there are all the other interventions. So think of uh, overexpression or um, et cetera, right? So, so these are soft interventions um, where you go in and, um, and you just change how a node acts on the next node, okay? So all of that would be uh, called a soft intervention. And so um, the question is, of course, you know, what can you do with interventions, right? How much do they help you? Um, can you develop algorithms? It's, it's not so easy, right? Because if you think about it, you know, if you have observational data, that data comes from one distribution. If I intervene on a node, then I'm shifting the distribution, right? That's a different distribution. So now you have data from all these different distributions. And together, you kind of want to learn one graph. Um, so think about it in that way, right? That, that it's, um, that's really what makes it hard, right? It's not so easy to actually combine all of these different data sets together to actually learn a one thing in the end, which is somehow something that, you know, so should um, connect all of these different distributions together. Okay, so what can we say? Um, so first of all, you know, we have to, if we want to come up with algorithms to actually do this, we have to think about, well, what can we even identify, right? So if you would have an infinite amount of data, what could you identify about the causal structure? And so this is something that has been known for a long time, right? Um, which I alluded to before um, in the observational setting, you know, in general, even if every node is observed, even if you have an infinite amount of data, you cannot um, identify the full causal graph. Um, you can only identify it up to something that is known as a Markov equivalence class. Meaning, for example, and this I'm sure you're all familiar with, if you just have observational data, you cannot say whether X causes Y or Y causes X. All you know is that they are correlated. Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry. so in this particular setting here, um, you can actually not identify which one of these two graphs is the right one. However, you can, of course, can, you know, um, distinguish this graph from, for example, this graph, etc. Okay, so this is what you can identify. Um, now, um, what we also know now is um, in the interventional setting, right? So you would hope that if you have interventional data, you can actually identify more, and you can. Um, so for hard interventions, um, this was done in this first paper here, um, Bühlmann's group. Um, so that's um, a really nice uh, paper that tells you, you know, how much more can you identify in these Markov equivalence classes. And what we showed, and this was left open as a question there, is that you know, actually for soft interventions, which are much less invasive, um, you actually get exactly the same interventional Markov equivalence classes. Okay? So no matter whether you perform these super invasive interventions or the less invasive ones, you can actually identify the same amount um, about, uh, regarding the underlying causal relationships. Okay, so now we know what we can identify in the best case, right? So um, if we want to now come up with algorithms, then they need to be able to identify this, right? Um, so you can now talk about consistency because before that you couldn't, right? Uh, before that, every algorithm is just some heuristic because you don't even know what you can learn in the best case when you have uh, the number of samples go to infinity. Okay, so I should say, so at this point, um, um, in this particular paper, there was a, an, a, an algorithm proposed uh, for doing this in the interventional setting, um, but we proved that it's actually not consistent. So even if you have an infinite amount of samples, um, it doesn't, it will not converge to the correct, in general, not converge to the correct um, causal um, Markov equivalence class. 
Okay, so then what do you do? So there are no such algorithms. Um, so we have to come up with a new way of thinking about um, these, these causal questions. Um, and it's a very, very simple and intuitive way of thinking about it. So, so you know, general algorithms before were usually going through the, so kind of, okay, so causality or causal inference is NP-hard. So you need to, you know, do some kinds of, um, some kinds of searches over the space of graphs and hopefully then still be able to prove that they actually converge to the correct graph. So usually these were doing some greedy search over the space of graphs, um, you know, taking the score functions, as for example, the BIC, et cetera. And it's pretty amazing that you can actually show, you know, you can define some set of moves that you can actually show that without intervention, just observational data that these searches are actually consistent, but this doesn't work in the interventional setting. Um, just because it is somehow a mixture of these different kinds of graphs and, you know, you can just make them um, get stuck on their search path. Um, so let's just think a bit differently about causality and it's just such a simple idea, but you know, so we want to learn a causal graph. It's a directed acyclic graph, right? Um, so what defines a directed acyclic graph? Well, it's defined by the undirected graph, which is known as the skeleton and a permutation an ordering of the nodes, right? Because if I give you an ordering and the skeleton, then you, uh, an undirected graph, then you just orient all of your edges according to the ordering of the nodes. So that, you know, you have an edge pointing forward if, uh, pointing from I to J, if I is smaller than J. Okay. So really the hard thing about actually causal inference or learning the underlying causal, causal structure discovery is that you have to learn the permutation because we all know how to learn undirected graphs. In particular, if I give you the correct permutation, well, you just do, you know, some conditional independence test. Basically, you just regress on your parents and you're done, right? You actually have the underlying, uh, get the corresponding causal graph. So the only hard part is actually learning the permutation. Okay, so then instead of doing a search over graphs, let's in fact do a search over permutations. Um, so the space of permutations is very, very nice. Um, so here's where some geometry comes in, right? Space of permutations is actually a nice polytope. Um, it's known as the permutahedron. Um, and so now I want to do a search over all permutations. Well, you know, you'll need to do greedy search, right? The this, this space actually becomes large quite fast. Um, so I'll do greedy search on the space, moving around from one permutation to the other. For every permutation, I can construct the corresponding DAG with the corresponding undirected graph. And now I need a score function, okay? And so the score function will just use the simplest possible score function, which is just the number of edges in the graph, okay? Just the sparsity. So without any assumptions um, on that the true graph is sparse, um, so I should be clear on this, you can still show that if you do this, then, you know, the sparsest graph is the true graph, okay? In particular, if the true graph is the full graph, then the sparsest graph is just a full polytope because all true graphs are Markov equivalent to each other. Okay, so this also works when the true graph is the complete graph, meaning you don't have any sparsity constraints. Um, so that's how it works. So you just start in a permutation, um, you construct its corresponding undirected graph, um, you know how many edges there are, you look at the neighbors, you construct their undirected graphs. If they have, you know, at least as many edge, uh, most as many edges as where you were, you just walk there and then you continue on, okay? So really the hard part about showing this is that you don't get stuck, right? I need to show that every local minimum in the search is actually a global minimum. Um, so that whatever happens, you know, you're walking around in the end when you're, when you're stuck, when there is no more, nothing to go to, you know that you actually reached the correct graph. And that's in fact the case. Okay. So this is uh, for observational data. And the nice thing is that this extends directly to interventional setting with hard interventions, soft interventions. Now we even have it with unknown intervention targets. Um, now we even have it with latent variables, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this permutation framework is really quite powerful in that regard. Um, why is it? Well, if you think of, you know, somehow before when I was talking about that the interventions shift the distribution, that's the case. Now, the problem is when you work over graphs, right, then the interventions also correspond to different graphs. However, the permutation is always the same, right? The permutation is somehow what is invariant, right? Whether I have an intervention here or there, well, the ordering of the variables is not going to change. Um, and so that's what we're using here, right? That's why you can get consistent algorithms where you're actually searching over permutations instead of over graphs, for example. Okay, so now in terms of, you know, 
it's always a question, right? These algorithms are empty hard, so how much can you scale them? Um, of course, if your true graph is the full graph, then you know you're just. I mean, usually you do some some depth first search here that you're saying like, hey, you know, I'll I'll search like five steps away, and then I'll just say I'll I'll, I'll stop off. So you're never going to get over this empty hardness. I mean, if it's the full graph, it's for you to be sure that you actually output the correct graph. You would have to go through all permutations. Um, so obviously, if it's the full graph, you know, these things don't scale as well. Um, but in general, you know, for these kinds of biological applications, you can easily do thousands of variables. Um, so what is interesting, I think, is that it is as fast as glasso in Python. Um, so glasso is what is used for learning undirected graphs, right? So you don't really pay a penalty um, in terms of actually learning a directed graph, so a causal graph here. So these are quite fast. And as I said, you can add an interventional data. This really helps, right? A completely different um, game um, when you actually have interventional data. It's just, it makes the problem so much more manageable to actually try to learn um, a causal graph, right? Because an intervention really tells you what happened, you know, who is upstream and who is downstream. So this can really, really help you. So if you want to play around with any of this, we have, you know, everything in uh, nice uh, Python packages with, you know, interventional data also, you know, different kinds of pre-processed, uh, perturb seek data, for example, um, where you can actually play around with all of these different kinds of algorithms. Okay, and I will show you an application in the end when we get to SARS-CoV-2, okay, where we really use these kinds of algorithms for actually figuring out these underlying gene regulatory networks. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview in terms of, you know, where, where are we in terms of um, causal structure discovery um, and actually learning gene regulatory networks, you know, do these algorithms scale nowadays? Um, yes, they do. 20,000 is still a bit hard. Usually you anyways pre-process, so but 1,000, 2,000 is, you know, definitely doable. If you really want to spend a lot of time, then maybe you can do 20,000. And people have done 20,000, in fact, with these algorithms um, when they look at brain um, and neurons and, you know, want to figure out the, the network between neurons. So Frederick Eberhardt is someone who has applied the algorithm I just showed you um, also on, you know, 100,000 nodes. So they do scale. Um, so that's maybe important to know. Okay, so that's um, a little bit here. And maybe I will um, just quickly see if there is any questions that I should answer before I go on. Um, let me quickly check. So not on Slido, maybe in the network. Since I'm changing topics. No, so there are no questions at, at the moment. I would have had one about the scalability, but this you, you, uh, you answered already. So I think you can. Perfect. Uh, okay, good. Um, so I hope you see how, I mean, okay, maybe I didn't say about how we validate these algorithms. But, you know, since you have um, knockout data or, you know, all kinds of other perturbations on genes data, how we validate it is we usually use only a portion of it, of the interventions, right? And we try to predict the effect of an intervention that we don't use um, for actually learning our gene regulatory networks. Um, so hopefully then that is exactly what this, this, um, this question here is, right? How can we use all of our interventional data that we have to predict um, the effect of a new intervention that is yet unseen? So that's exactly how we validate this, this types of algorithms. Okay, so that hopefully answers um, this kind of question. Of course, I don't think we're anywhere there that we can just say we're done with it. I think these algorithms, you know, this causal inference problem is just a very hard one. Um, I do think that there is a whole lot to do in terms of, um, you know, um, off target effects. Um, there is noise, there is a measurement noise. How can we better take care of this, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that are, you know, also RNA seq, single cell RNA seq specific and intervention specific. Um, that really should go into um, better algorithms here so that we can do a better job at actually solving this one problem. And of course, maybe completely different approaches than graphical models, because I still don't think that it is necessary to learn the full underlying graphical model uh, in order to be a good at predicting, you know, the effect of a new intervention. So I think this is just where we are right now. Okay. So um, I'll go now move over to these other three transport problems, right, which all sound very similar, but we're going to take a very different approach, um, which is using autoencoder. So not actually trying to even learn the full underlying causal graph. In particular, based on images, you don't even know what the causal variables are, right? Um, so we really do need to take a different kind of approach. I mean, in RNA-seq, at least you have 
you have a coordinate system, you have genes, right? So these can be my causal variables and images, you know, what are you going to take as your coordinate system? Um, so that's an important question where also autoencoders can be helpful as we'll see here. Um, so all of this is going to be on autoencoders in particular. Um, I'm going to present this work here that you know, got accepted to PNS earlier this week. Um, so what are autoencoders? I'm sure many of you are familiar um, with autoencoders. Um, so these are special neural networks that you know, we really came to love in our group and many others do as well. Um, so these are special autoencoders as special neural networks in the sense that they're not classification networks. They are a function from RD to RD, okay? So if you put in here an image, out comes an image of the same size. If you put in our single cell RNA-seq, out comes you know, an expression um, vector of the same size, okay? And they consist of two parts, an encoder and a decoder. Usually, or classically, um, this space here in the middle, uh, which is known as the latent space, has been lower dimensional um, than the input space because, you know, I mean, first of all, okay, so, so in, uh, the intuition comes maybe, for example, if you think of PCA, right, you want to find some lower dimensional representation of, the, of your data. Um, but also, you know, what was the thinking is that, hey, if we make it very high dimensional, um, then, you know, this neural network will, could, it has the capacity to just learn the identity function and that's probably not what you care about, right? You want to find some meaningful representation here in the latent space um, that captures something interesting about, you know, whatever your images are that you're putting in your single cell RNA seq or maybe you can cluster your data nicely or, you know, you want to find a meaningful um, representation of your data, right? Um, so that was the intuition that, you know, this should be lower dimensional, um, and that's how, you know, all autoencoders are currently um, done, right? Um, so, okay, so how are these autoencoders trained? I didn't say that. So if you have a training, um, training set, um, RNA-seq, images, whatever you have, and um, what you want to do is you just train it to minimize reconstruction error. So I have my image, and I want whatever comes out on this side to be as similar as possible to what I put it. Okay, so psi is a function that maps me from RD to RD, um, or from input to output space. So psi uh, XIs are my training examples, and so psi of XI is whatever comes out, um, and you know XI is whatever I put in. So I want this here, say, to norm to be minimized, right, over all um, my training examples. So that's how you train it. Um, and now, of course, the question is, when I put in new images that were not in my training set, what happens? Okay. So this is the space that is usually used for downstream analysis um, in terms of looking at your data, using the representation that is learned, et cetera. Okay. So I want to understand, you know, there are many, many questions here. I want to understand what do these neural networks actually learn? What is this representation that is learned? How should I choose depth and width, right? So this is the depth. And then here, of course, you have a width somewhere here. Um, how to, should I choose these things? Um, and in general, what is the function class that is actually learned by these uh, neural networks? So that's the question I want to answer. And in particular, um, so we see this in the classification setting that, you know, people are going more and more to this over-parameterized setting, right? You just, you just want to make these neural networks as large as possible, even though they can then get down to loss zero. Um, it seems like they're still generalizing very, very well, okay? And so that's the setting I want to analyze, namely the setting which was, you know, not the one that is usually used, namely where here, for example, I actually have this layer be very big. Um, I'm over-parameterized, I could learn the identity function. But what I'm going to show you is actually that, neural, that an autoencoder does not learn an identity function, okay, which is really interesting. Um, so it might actually learn something very, very interesting here in the latent layer, even though you're just over-parameterized. Okay, so this is the setting I'm going to look at. So I have n training examples. I'm going to make my neural network very large. Um, so in particular, n is smaller than rk. Um, so, and um, now usually, as I said, they're used, they're trained using some stochastic gradient descent methods, et cetera. Um, it initialized close to zero. Um, so now for the theoretical analysis, I will be analyzing just gradient descent, um, but I'll show you in, you know, all of the different um, um, experimental tests that it really doesn't matter what kind of optimization method you use, you'll see exactly the same results. And this is what we're trying to optimize as I showed already on the previous slide. 
Okay, so now um, let's look at the following question. Um, in the over-parameterized setting. And let me just actually simplify this. Let's just look at the linear setting, okay? I want to just, so that we all go through this exercise of just trying to figure out what is actually happening. So Psi in general is a highly nonlinear function, right, which represents the full network. Let me now just, for the sake of just trying to think through this problem, let me say Psi is just a linear function. And let me say I just have one training example, okay? Oops, okay, this is great. So um, let me say I have just one training example. So then the problem becomes this here, right? And I want to minimize this two norm squared, whatever you want to take. So I want to minimize this. So argmin over all a in this case in r k times k, right? So obviously, you know, this problem here can be, so this thing here, I can get it down to zero, right? Um, the loss, I mean, if I take away the arc. So I can certainly get this down to zero, right? Because this is highly over-parameterized. In particular, there are many, many solutions that make this zero. So for example, A equal to the identity matrix will certainly make this zero, right? Because then here you just get X minus X. Um, or, you know, the projection onto X will make this zero, right? So this would be a rank one solution. Projection onto X will make this zero. And similarly, there are many, many solutions that will make this zero, right? So the question is, so, you know, when you train, obviously, you know, you will get the solution out. So you're going to get some A matrix out that will make this loss basically zero up to, you know, numerical precision um, or as long as you train, right? But the question is, well, what is the neural network learning, right? Is it the identity matrix? Is it a rank one matrix? Is it something completely different? So what is it that the neural network is learning in order to get a loss zero? Okay, if it's the identity matrix, then that's really not that interesting, right? Because that means that I'm just taking my images and I'm putting it out. I don't have to do any training, right? To get the identity matrix, whatever you're going to put in, the same will come out. So certainly no interesting representation will be learned in the latent space. Okay, so let me show you an experiment. Okay, so here is, you know, a very standardly used unit, autoencoder, convolutional, deep, et cetera, you know, has all of the features that you usually use. Um, so uh, let's just see, I just trained it on, I mean, not I, um, a group trained it on, on um, one example. And let's see what actually happens when you just have one training example, what is the function that is learned? Okay, so let's see what happens. So here you'd put in any other images or noise or, you know, whatever you like, and you'll see what comes out is always the same image. Okay, so that's, I mean, so what it means it learned is the point function, right? It maps anything you put in to this rabbits. So it certainly didn't learn the identity function. Um, it learned a, a very special function, right? That maps everything to the training example. So that's interesting. So the question is, is this a general phenomenon? Um, is this surprising to you? Um, and I, I would argue it should be surprising to you. Um, let me tell you why. Um, so first of all, as I showed already before, there are infinitely many solutions in the over-parameterized setting, right? There are infinitely many um, functions that will map the rabbit to the rabbit, but it can do whatever it wants on all of the other images. Um, so it is certainly surprising because, you know, in particular, if you take a shallow convolutional network and I train it on one training example, hey, what comes out, you put in anything else, you'll see that actually what comes out is something that looks quite close to the identity function. Okay, it's not quite the identity function. You see here that, right, it, it messed it up a little bit. It's becoming a bit more blurry. Um, so it's, um, it's, but it's certainly a high rank solution and not a, you know, not a point function onto one image. And similarly, um, if you look at linear networks, um, and it doesn't matter whether convolutional, fully connected, deep, shallow, whatever you want to do, um, if it's a linear network, then you'll see that, in fact, whatever comes out. So here I'm just showing it on two training examples, just because then you see it nicer, that it's actually learning a projection onto your training examples. Okay, so you see here that it's learning a combination of, of the airplane and the dog. Um, and in fact, I should say that these are things that we can prove. Um, so I should always distinguish between what do we only have experimental evidence and what can we actually prove. Uh, so certainly this year you can prove quite easily. And this year here, what we can prove is that, you know, you're not going to memorize your training example. Um, so, it, so it's uh, certainly um, 
necessary to have depth for convolutional um, networks in order to learn, be able to learn something like memorization, which we had on this previous slide here. Okay, so the question is really what is happening, right? Um, so can I generalize this phenomenon to more than one image? Um, why, what is the importance of depth um, in the convolutional setting? Uh, what is the importance of the nonlinearity, right? As we saw, if you have just linear networks, then this is not going to happen. So these are the questions that I want to answer. So now I think, you know, all of you who have played around with autoencoders, you'll know that if I put in a lot of images, it's not the case that, you know, whatever you put in always at the output is the training image. So you already know that's definitely not going to be the case. So the question is, what are the functions? What is the function class that is actually being learned? Okay, so let me do it on many images. Okay, so now I trained on many images. Um, I don't remember, maybe 100 here. Um, so um, I trained on many images and I'm going to put in some corrupted training images, quite heavily corrupted, right? I'm, I'm removing 50% of the image. And I'm asking um, what comes out. Okay, so this is the standard thing when you apply an autoencoder, only look at the first part here. Um, this is what comes out. So certainly not a training image comes out. Okay, so definitely it's not the case in general that, you know, you have the same phenomena as what I showed you when you just train a hugely deep um, autoencoder on one training image. So if you have more training images in general, what comes out is not your training image and all of you know that that's actually the case, right? Um, okay, so what is happening? So um, what, we, what is really nice, and this is how we analyzed the kind of and found and were able to identify what the function class is that is, that is learned by autoencoders, is that you can, because it's a function from RD to RD, well, what you can do is you can iterate the function, right? So whatever comes out, the image that comes out, I can put it back in and see, you know, I just iterate the map and see what happens, okay? And so that's what we did here. So, okay, you, you take, you get an image out. We just put it back into the autoencoder, the trained autoencoder, and you see what comes out and you just iterate and iterate. And you'll see that in the end, you actually get one of your training images back. Okay, um, so that's, uh, I think, a very nice phenomenon of, you know, to tell you what is the function class that is learned by, by these overparameterized autoencoders. So these are functions that are heavily contractive at the training examples. Okay, this is a very special function class, right? That means that these autoencoders are self-regularizing, right? They, they like to stay close to the training examples, which, you know, and I'll argue about maybe on the next slide how useful this is. Um, but let's maybe just go through a couple more of, just to make clear we all understand what this phenomenon means. Um, so let's see here, for example, so maybe first we go through the others. I mean, you see here that, you know, even if you remove 50% of the image in the center, um, and you do this thing of this corrupted, just run these corrupted images. Oh, so here it says also on how many images I trained, um, or no, this is not the case. Okay, so so here, um, 421, um, so 421 out of 500, if you just put in, oh yeah, sorry, this is, so this means 500 training images were used. Um, so if you corrupt these 400, uh, four, you corrupt these training images by, you know, setting half of it to noise and you just, uh, iterate the map, you see that in 421 of the cases, you actually end up in the correct training image. So that means the, the basins of attractions are really quite large, right? Um, and it depends a bit on where, you know, what kind of part of the image you're removing. But this is still quite impressive that you're actually ending up at the, at the right image. Um, and here are just some examples, right? Um, so, so let me just show you in 2D how this works. So here my training examples are these stars, okay? And what we did now is, so we trained. Um, so this is a map from R2 to R2, okay? And now we just put a grid on this, um, on this R2. Um, and we looked at, we just iterated the map from each point on the grid. And we saw where does this point converge to? Um, so first of all, what is amazing is that each one of the points converges to one of the training examples, okay? This is also not clear a priori that there are no other um, maybe that there is, you know, that it could cycle around or that it is attracted to some other point. So all of them are attracted to our training examples. And in color, you just see, you know, all of these points here will be converging to this training example. All of the red points will be converging to this one, etc. So here you see the basins of attraction. So they certainly don't look like, you know, our nice Euclidean balls, etc. Um, so they are slightly different. And so this is certainly an important question to answer, um, which we don't have an answer to is, you know, what is the metric that is learned by an autoencoder, right? How is the space actually um, broken up? Okay, so um, in terms of actually, um, 
you know, learning these big networks, if you see it. So we trained on 500 ImageNet examples, um, quite small networks, right? Um, and, you know, some nonlinearity, etc. And what is quite uh, impressive is that you can make all these 500 examples be fixed points, attractive fixed points. So you can prove that, right? I just, all I have to do is um, look at you know, at the, at, the, at the derivative at all of these examples and the, eigen, uh, eigen, um, the eigenvalues there, right? So I need all of them to be smaller than one. And then I know that it is an attractive fixed point. Um, and so, so I can prove that these 500 training examples are in fact attractive fixed points. Now, what is hard to prove is that there are no other attractors, right? So like here in this example, you know, I cannot prove that there are no other attractors. I can just test at all of these grid points that there is no, that all of them converge to one of my training examples. And so that's the same what we did here. I mean, we took so many examples. We took like all kinds of noises, all kinds of other images, et cetera. And all of them always converge to one of our training examples. Okay. So, but of course we don't have a proof that there are no other um, attractive fixed points in this whole space. Okay, so you can really do this for very, very large um, amounts of training data. Um, and so maybe this is the most important slide just to really understand what is the function class that is learned by autoencoders. Um, okay, so what is it what we can prove? Uh, so as I showed you before, it doesn't matter how many training examples you have, as long as you're over-parameterized, you will get them as, as uh, attractive fixed points. What we can prove is we can only prove it for one training example. So for one training example, we can prove, and here, if I write suitable conditions on the nonlinearity and initialization, so all of the standard nonlinearities actually fall into this class of suitable conditions. Initialization is just the standard one close to zero. Um, actually, any training example can be made an attractor with appropriate depth. Okay, so what, what we have here is a, a formula for these eigenvalues of the Jacobian. So what you care about is the maximum eigenvalue and absolute value of the Jacobian. For it to be an attractive fixed point, you need it to be smaller than one. Um, so we have a formula for this that just depends on D. So um, D is the depth, K is the width, and nonlinearity initialization. And you can just figure out what, what is the depth, uh, for example, needed in order to make this an attractive fixed point. Okay, so this is quite, I think, I mean, still quite a surprising, even if it's on one sample, on one training example, right? Because, I mean, if you think about how, so if, if you actually don't, and it's, it, this is really a consequence of training, right? Because if you don't train your neural network, this is not going to happen. Your training example is not going to be an attractive fixed point, right? It's a super strong constraint that all of the eigenvalues at your training example of the Jacobian have to be smaller than one. Um, that's, you know, if you have depth D, right? So, um, or whatever, so you're in a high dimensional space. So say in that, in that, um, in that layer, or in this case uh, with K, um, if you're in K dimensional space, K is very, very large. Um, then, you know, the probability that each one of the directions, um, you know, is smaller than one, right? Is smaller than 45 degrees is, is one half, right? So you get the probability of one half to the power of K and K is very large. So in general, this is not the case. You really need training in order for this to happen. Okay. Um, so now, of course, as I said, we all know that deep overparameterized convolutional neural networks um, can interpolate training data, but I do want to just highlight that interpolation is not the same as what we're showing here, right? This is memorization, although in, in literature, memorization and, and interpolation is often used interchangeably. Um, I would argue that that's uh, problematic, right? Memorization is more than, than, um, than um, interpolation, right? Because memorization also requires that you're able to recover the training example, not just that you're able to store it. Um, so in particular, you know, a function like this certainly interpolates our three training examples, right? It goes through the three training examples, but you're certainly not able to recover the training examples. So what we're showing is that actually um, over-parameterized autoencoders are able to recover the training examples and the, the mechanism to recover them is just iterating the map. Okay, so what we saw at the beginning when you just have one training example or you know, very few and a huge depth, then what happens is you're actually learning a piecewise constant function. So whatever comes out is already one of your training examples. However, in general, you know, what you learn um, when you have many examples and not too much depth 
is actually a function that is just interpo that is interpolating the training examples and contractive at the training examples, meaning that if I iterate this map, then you know I get out my training examples. So this here we know you know converges to this function over here if you iterate it. Okay, so um, you know this means that these alternate coders are very nice uh, self-regularizing functions, right? Um, when you have them be over, param uh, over parameterized, um, they don't learn some crazy functions. Although you know they have the capacity to learn all these crazy functions, they actually learn functions that we would say you know make a lot of sense, right? They are still staying close to the training examples, um, and in particular, if you iterate them, um, you'll okay. get. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. There's one question um, on Slido, which maybe fits here uh, very well. Mm -hmm. The question is, thanks for the talk. What do you mean when you say that the over-parameterized autoencoders are self-regularizing? Okay, perfect. I'll explain it here. Um, so self-regularizing means, you know, they have the capacity to learn any function, like the crazy function that I'm showing here. They have the capacity to learn the identity function, right? Um, but they are instead learning a function that is close to the training image. So they are self-regularizing themselves in terms of actually learning a, in this case, a function that is highly contractive at the training examples, right? So this is a regularity um, assumption. So in particular, if you look at it before, it's like learning a low rank function, right? Um, so low rank would be a different way of regularizing. That, that's what you could see in the, in the linear setting, right? You're learning a projection onto your training examples. That's uh, self-regularization. Here, when you have non-linearities, the self-regularization that is happening, even though you're more and more open, in fact, even though you over-parameterize more and more, or you add more and more depth, in fact, you're going to see a function that becomes more and more like this. Right. What you see, saw with one training example, it becomes more and more like a stepwise function. So no matter what you put in, you, exact, you immediately get out the training example. Well, if you're not super, super over parameterized, you don't get out immediately a training example. But if you iterate the map, you will actually get out one of your training examples. So that's certainly a form of self regularization Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, also, maybe a question about generalization, since I will just answer it since many people ask about this. Hey, you know, these functions don't seem to generalize. And okay, so we have to, first of all, you know, what is the definition of generalization in autoencoders? I also think that is kind of confusing how it is currently used. Um, so often it is used as learning the identity map, or, you know, you generalize well if you learn a function as close to the identity. Well, I would argue that, you know, learning the identity map doesn't even require training. So how can that be a function that generalizes well? Okay. So, I mean, I don't need to train anything. If you really want to get the identity map, then just take the identity map. Um, so we certainly need a different kind of definition of, of generalization for autoencoders. Um, it should not be the identity map. Um, I don't think there is any definition yet, but, you know, maybe it could be something like, hey, you know, base, you, you still need to be able to get back uh, your example if you heavily corrupt it. Um, something like that, right? Um, which would be, you kind of want to be close to the identity map, but certainly not the identity map. You don't want to, you know, get out, for example, your corrupted training example, right? If you put in a training example that is corrupted, um, you want to get out the training example itself. Um, so probably it is something like you want it actually to be contractive at the training examples, but at the same time, be close to the identity map. But I think something like this, a very, you know, a good notion of generalization, um, in terms of for autoencoders is just not defined yet. But it might indeed be something like, you know, contractive at the training examples, but close to the identity function. And that's exactly what we're showing, what these uh, functions are actually learning. Okay, so, um, okay, so now you can also ask um, what happens with width and depth if you increase width, if you increase depth in terms of over parameterization, you know, does it have different kinds of effects? And, this is quite interesting, I think, here is um, to see what is the different effects. And this kind of shows you that maybe you want to increase width instead of increasing depth, which you know, I've already alluded to in the previous slides. Um, so, so here we're looking at the maximum eigenvalue. So for, it to, for the training example to be attractive, we know it has to be smaller than one. Um, so what you see here quite nicely with increasing width is that what happens to the distribution of the maximum eigenvalue is that it um, changes the variance, okay? So it just makes the variance become smaller. So that's how somehow it makes the examples more attractive. Whereas increasing depth makes the whole distribution shift. 
Okay, so why does this make, and you know, you see the same if, we, if I just look at the top 10% of eigenvalues, it's exactly the same. So increasing width this, um, makes the variance smaller of the distribution, increasing depth shifts the whole distribution. Okay, so that's quite interesting. So if you think about it, if generalization is kind of um, how I defined it, um, just before on the previous slide, if you want to find something that's kind of close to the identity map, but still, um, you know, um, nicely contractive at the training examples, well, then um, what you want to do is really increasing width, right? Because you want to increase in width and then, you know, increase depth a little bit so that they all become contractive because you want to have the eigenvalues all close to one, certainly not too much over uh, close to zero, because then this thing happens where just everything immediately gets mapped to your training examples. So you want to have them all close to one and then just move the distribution. So have so much depth so that, you know, they're all contractive, but certainly not super, super contractive. Um, so this kind of research also tells, gives you a bit of insight of how one should actually choose the network architecture um, in order to learn meaningful representations. Um, so let me do the following. So um, what I want to show you here is that the same kind of framework can also be used to embed sequences. So instead of, you know, training that you map one image to itself, I could train that I have, you know, I have 100 images that I want to remember, that I want to autoencode. Well, let me just map the first image to the second, the second to the third, et cetera, and the last image to the first and see what happens, right? So what happens if you put in random noise then? Um, because you're breaking these attractor conditions, right? So, so we could maybe think that maybe, hey, with this, the whole thing will break down and, you know, my training examples are not going to be memorized anymore. Um, so we did this for movies. Um, so here you'll see a um, nice Mickey Mouse, the first Mickey Mouse movie. So you see here, so I trained, you know, we trained on a, on a sequence of images, mapping the first one to the next one, et cetera. Um, and we just start with random noise. And what you get out is actually the full sequence. Okay, so you just memorize the full sequence. You can do this on um, multiple sequences. Uh, so here we, we trained on two sequences, you know, um, one is counting upwards, one is counting downwards on uh, MNIST numbers. And, you know, you just iterate it from noise and you'll see that one sequence, you know, you, you actually don't jump around between different sequences, although the numbers are so similar, you just keep inside your sequence. And here you can see it in 2D, just so that you really see what is going on. I started randomly. You see all these points, they already went out to one of their limit cycles and they're just keeping cycling around. And here you see once it converged, how it actually looks like. Okay, so the sequence encoding, um, this is actually quite interesting here. So we found that sequence encoding is much more effective at memorization than um, if you just have single images, which is very similar to how our brains work as well, right? much easier to actually remember whole sequences of things than to memorize each one of the events separately. And that's what you see here. So if you autoencode 100 images, um, you need, you know, actually even with this depth, a large depth and width, you still don't memorize all of them. However, you know, here, if you encode them as a sequence, so same 100 images, but now I encode them as, in this case, five sequences of 20 images each, you see that, you know, already with depth six and quite, and the large width, um, you can memorize all of them. And you see that, you know, here in particular, if we just take all of the images and we just encode them as one long sequence, um, same hundred images, right? I am already um, able to memorize all of them with a very, very small network. Okay. So it's much, much more effective to actually, um, auto encode uh, to, to memorize images or, you know, this associative memory aspect is much more um, effective when you do this in sequences instead of in single images, which is quite interesting and certainly something that needs to be analyzed and understood in terms of how our memory works as well. Um, in terms of math, this is actually very easy to prove, right? It's much easier to have um, the largest eigenvalue be smaller than one if you take, if you multiply up all eigenvalues, than if you have to have each eigenvalue be smaller than one. And that's why we also got to try this out. Um, so it's nice when you have the mathematical intuition and then you actually see that this really happens. Okay, so this was all done by an amazing PhD student that we have, um, Adit Radhakrishnan, on this whole work and in collaboration with Misha Belkin, um, who just moved um, to UC San Diego. Okay, so um, 
let me now tell you a bit about, so this is all the work on actually understanding autoencoder. This has helped us hugely in terms of the applications. And now let me see how long I have. So it's 10.04. Okay, so if I have another 15 minutes or so, and then I'll take questions. So I'll actually want to tell you a bit about the applications of where we use this, right, for these autoencoder applications here. Okay, and in particular, the last application, the SARS-CoV-2 application, is where we really used our insights in over-parameterization. These first two applications here were what motivated us to actually look at the theory of autoencoder. So you'll see that we're not yet used it. Uh, we are using it in the third application when, you know, graphical models and over-parameterized autoencoders actually all come together. Okay, so, but these are built based on autoencoders. So let's see how we can use autoencoders, in fact, for example, um, to translate between different data modalities or to translate between different time points. Okay, so we're translating between different modalities. Um, so how do you do this using autoencoders? Okay, so what do we do? Um, so say this is RNA-seq, this is imaging, this is a tag-seq, this is whatever you want to look at, single cell high C, et cetera. Okay, so I would like to be able to translate between these different uh, modalities. Um, so what am I doing? I have here four different autoencoders, okay? Each one of them goes from a data modality, so in this case RNA-seq, to some latent space and back again. And the latent space is shared among all these different autoencoders, okay? So they all map to the same latent space. Now, why does this make sense? Well, you know, in this application, we're assuming that it's the same population of cells, right? I just took some out for imaging and some out for sequencing. So it's the same cells, so they should be matched in the same latent space and the same distribution in the latent space, right? Because it is the same population of cells. Um, so what we do to kind of, you know, couple all these autoencoders, um, although, you know, they are decoupled, right? But they're only coupled in the latent space is that you have an, a, a discriminator in the latent space to make sure that the two distributions are the same in the latent space because it's the same population of cells. Okay, so what you're doing to enforce this is, well, you have an additional penalty which tells you, hey, if you can tell, I mean, I'm now the discriminator, if I can tell that this data point comes from RNA-seq land as compared to image land, well, then I'm going to be pun punished, right? I really need the two distributions to match in the latent space. Okay, and then with that, of course, now I have a map, right, that goes from, from RNA-seq to latent space, and I have a map that goes from latent space to image. So if I just concatenate the two maps, what I can do is you give me a particular RNA-seq profile, I can tell you how that image looks like, and of course, the other way around. And just to show you how this works, I mean, here, just because it's easier to understand it on, on you know, faces, say now my data modalities are black haired females, blonde haired females, brown, black haired males, blonde haired males, etc. These are all the different data modalities. Um, these are the only real images. I trained it, of course, in other real images of blonde haired females. I put in this um, black haired female and I, this here is a generated image, it's not a real image, right? Generated image of how this woman lo would look like were she blonde, how this woman would look like were she a man and black haired, how this woman would have looked like were she a man and blonde haired. Okay, so that's exactly concatenating these maps and, and actually generating the corresponding image. And so here is how it works on, you know, the problem that we actually care about. Um, so this is in T cells of, uh, you know, DAPI stained images and, and RNA-seq profile and the other way around, RNA-seq profile to actually get out um, the image. And now, of course, you know, as I said, you know, these things cannot be measured in the same cell. So how can we ever be able to validate something like this? Well, how you validate it is in this case, um, I mean, how we validated it um, is that um, you, you, what you can do in an image is, of course, you can use other color channels, right? And so here, for example, we took other proteins um, and, you know, we have RNA-seq, right? Or, or in this case, so we have an image, right? We start with an image. Um, yeah, so you start with an image, right? You go to the latent space you, and you can predict RNA-seq. Well, in this case, you know, unfortunately, there is still a gap between RNA-seq and protein levels. That's unfortunately what we have to deal with. Um, and so we can predict the protein levels and 
And from there, of course, this can then be validated, at least for some proteins. I cannot do it on all these, you know, like what I would have on RNA-seq where I have 20,000 genes. This I cannot do in the image, but at least I can take two or three other proteins in the same image and look at them and see if I'm actually able to predict their values. And that's exactly how we did the validation here. So of course it's limited, it's only like two or three at the same time, right? You can do it over other ones, um, but that's at least um, one way of validating that what you're doing actually is working, right? That I can really go from an image to predicting, um, in this case, the protein levels. And by image, I mean the DAPI stained image. And Karsten, you have another question. Caroline, there's another question that is very topical here on Slido. This is Perfect. how do you trade off between reconstruction error minimization and maximizing the matching of the distributions of the two modalities in, in I assume, in latent space? Yeah, okay, those are great questions. Um, so usually actually how we do it is maybe a bit different. The, I mean, the trade off of course comes in, but um, okay, so let me tell you how we train these things. So usually we first start off, so there will be one of the data modalities that are, is more informative, meaning it needs a larger dimensional latent space in order to be able to be reconstructed well. Okay, so that's how you choose. So in terms of the trade-off, it's more about how you choose the, the dimension of the latent space so that this can actually both be low, right? So uh, usually for us here in this application, we would start with images and we would start with a latent space dimension large enough so that we're happy with a reconstruction, whatever that means for you. For us, you know, we care about certain features in the image that at least have to be reconstructed well. Okay, so that will depend on the application. Then only do we add in, you know, the RNA-seq to match the distribution in the latent space. And this will now actually be not so hard anymore because this is much less informed. Um, so that's how we do it. So it depends, you know, this is not a real trade-off in the sense that, you know, you just uh, have to choose the latent space dimension large enough. And as we saw in the previous part of the talk, you should anyways choose it very large um, <laughs> because this is not going to hurt you, okay? Um, so, so this is really not a real trade-off anymore in some sense. Mm -hmm. So choose it large. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, just because I always get these questions, people are familiar with CycleGAN. This is very different to CycleGAN in the sense that, you know, CycleGAN requires you, so CycleGAN goes directly between different modalities. Um, CycleGAN uh, requires you to have one discriminator in each latent space, um, whereas here you just have a discriminator in, uh, sorry, one late one discriminator in each modality, right? Which is usually very high dimensional. Here you have only one discriminator in the latent space. Also for biological applications, you do want to have all your data in the latent space because now you can do all the downstream analysis in your latent space. Uh, for example, clustering, for example, and we'll see another application on the next slide. Also canonical correlation analysis. And this advantage there is, you know, you need to have the same input and output dimension, right? So um, in particular, there is no way you can do canonical correlation analysis um, combining images and RNA-seq. Okay, so these are, you know, the two main kinds of approaches um, which just don't work here. Um, so that's um, this, how you can use autoencoders to actually very easily um, combine different modalities and trans translate between different kinds of modalities. And we validated it here in this T-cell example. Um, you'll have to read it in order to figure out what is exactly the biology that we cared about finding out here. Okay, so then comes the next problem about moving between different time points for cell lineage tracing, for example. Um, okay, so if, and, and, um, Oh, here I don't have, oh yeah, I do have the reference. So this is a really nice paper that came out of the Broad um, for doing lineage tracing um, on um, using single cell RNA-seq data. Okay, and so their idea, and this is, you know, a very nice standard statistical um, framework for, you know, you have a distribution of cells, right, at time point one and at time point two, and I would like to know how does this distribution of cells fit onto this distribution of cells. So the standard statistical approach is optimal transport, right? It, it actually does exactly that problem. It tries to find this map, this transport map that minimizes the effort um, of moving this whole sand pile, which is a distribution, to this whole sand pile, which is a distribution. And this is a really nice paper where they did this um, in RNA-seq, um, using RNA-seq data. Um, so now the question is, how do you do this on images? So we really care about images, as I told you, right? I care about, you know, applications to cancer. I want to be able to detect cancer as early as possible. In particular, you know, I, I, I would like to be able to do it earlier than pathologists currently. So that means I need to be able to generate my own data of how this cancer cell would have looked like at earlier time points, right? Before a pathologist right now can tell me that it is actually on the path of getting cancerous. 
opaque. So how do I do this with images, right? So how do I define a transport map on images? Um, because in an image, as I said, there is no coordinate system, right? I mean, you know, pixel one in, in an image of a cell doesn't correspond to anything in the second cell in pixel one. I mean, these cells, you know, have different shapes. They have like, you know, there are all kinds of orientations. You cannot really orient them so that they correspond to each other. So how do you do this? How can you come up with a coordinate system? Like RNA-seq has worked wonderfully, right? Gene one corresponds to gene one in another cell. So I can actually define a transport map or I can define a, you know, a, a loss function, right, which tells me how different these two genes are. Um, but how do you do this right on images? And again, you know, often coders are one way of getting a joint coordinate system. So I take here, I have four, um, four populations of cells. In this case, it's cell lines, but we also did it on tissues and single cells there. This is just to show you how this works. So you have these different cell lines, you map it into the latent space. And now, as I said, you know, the latent space is amazing because now you can do everything based on that you know, right, that you can do with RNA-seq. You can now do it with images because now you have a coordinate system. They're all in a joint coordinate system and you can do whatever you were used to doing with RNA-seq now on images. For example, you can do optimal transport. Okay, so I can learn the transport map of how I get from the metastatic images back, how this particular image or this particular cell would have looked like, was it still in the normal state? So now this is in this latent space, but of course an autoencoder allows you from any point in the latent space to generate its corresponding image. And that's exactly what we did here. So we take a metastatic cell, this is real cells, all of the others are generated cells, they're not real. So I take a cell like this, map it to the latent space, use my transport map to move all the way backwards to the normal state, and all of these images are generated. Okay, so now I can actually generate images how this cell would have looked like at earlier time points. Now again, exactly this thing I cannot validate, um, but what we did validate is we looked at um, the activation of fibroblasts now over time in an experiment so that we were actually able to validate the kinds of features that we found, you know, predictive of going forwards in time or backwards in time in this particular system. Okay, so that's another, I think, very nice way of, you know, the autoencoder is super helpful for any of these things, right? Getting joint coordinate spaces um, or moving between data modalities as we saw on the previous slide. Okay, so all of this motivated our work um, on autoencoders um, and looking at the theory of like, you know, how should we choose our, our architectures? What are the functions that are learned? Why do these autoencoders work so well for all these particular applications? And that's what motivated what I presented before. So now, now that we have all this insight on overparameterization, let's actually try to use it. Um, and so here is how we're using it um, now in the SARS-CoV-2 application, okay? So as I said, so here, and this is the last application I just want to show, um, so here, um, this is the problem of drug repurposing, right? So in COVID-19, um, you know, we don't want to go through the whole FDA approval all the way from the beginning. Um, you want to be using, to do it fast, right? You want to be using um, drugs that are already approved um, that can maybe be repurposed uh, for a different kind of disease. And so there is this huge, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this huge CMAP um, um, data, which is um, available um, by the Broad, right, which is an amazing resource, um, which has 1.2 million samples. These are 1,000 dimensional, so these are expression, represent expression vectors. Many, many different kinds of perturbations. We particularly cared about these FDA approved drugs and applied to many, many different cell types, so hundreds of different cell types. That's what you see here in different colors. So this data is available. So now what we would like to be able to do is, you know, predict, so use any of these drugs and predict the effect of this drug on a different cell type. And now of course we can validate it right in this data set just because we have all these different cell types and we have these drugs that have been applied to many different cell types. Because then if we can, if it works in these cell types and hopefully it will also work on, you know, a SARS-CoV-2 infected cell that we care about, right? Okay, so if you are a machine learning person, then you know, probably you'll think about it, hey, you know, as a style transfer problem, right? Maybe a drug can just be a style. Um, so you probably know this, right? So here I have a neutral face, a smiley face, and this has worked very well in vision problems. I encode them into the latent space. Um, so this is my neutral face, this is my smiley face. So this vector here corresponds to putting on a smile. Now here comes a new person, neutral face. I want to make the image of this person smile. Um, so I take this vector, I put it here, and I look at what this point is, I decode it to the image space, and hey, this person comes out smiling. 
Okay, so this works really, really well. So this tra style transfer works really, really well um, for image applications um, and many other applications. So the question is, can I do this for drugs, right? I have a cell type. I know its effect. Um, I know how it changes when I add the drug. I have a new cell type. I want to predict what happens when I add the same drug. So can I just take this vector, which corresponds to adding the drug, move it over here and see what comes out? Okay. And, you know, I just want to, um, you know, there is work related to this um, in the linear setting and here when you actually know the underlying graph. So um, it's very nice work that says that in general, you cannot do this. Okay, perturbations are not the same as just the style. There are if and only if conditions, if you know the underlying causal graph that tells you when actually, you know, you can transport the causal effect. Um, but still, you know, the question is here, we don't have a causal graph. We can certainly not check any of these conditions. So can, does this work? Right? We can actually check it if it works on this particular cell, on this particular data set. And let me tell you that it doesn't work. Okay, so in general, so usually, I mean, in general, you use these underparameterized autoencoders, right? Um, and so here, what I'm showing you is I'm taking two different cell types. Um, and I'm taking here, so what I want is the effect of the drug in cell type one and cell type two to be aligned, right? Because only then can I transport over this effect, move it over here and actually get out what the real effect of the drug. If these two drug effects are not aligned, then this cannot work, right? So here on the previous slide, these two vectors are not aligned, this, this approach cannot work. So I'm, I'm, what I'm showing you is the, vec is the angles between the effect of a drug. So each point here is a different drug applied in the, in the um, uh, sorry, it's the angle between the same drug applied to two different cell types. Okay, so these angles go between minus one and one. Um, and this is for these underparameterized autoencoders. And you see whether you do it in the original space or in an autoencoder, you know, with an underparameterized latent space, these angles are always the same. Um, they don't really change, so they don't make these things better aligned or worse aligned. It doesn't really matter whether you just do this in the autumn, in the original space or in the in the latent space of the autoencoder. And of course, you know when you use these underparameterized autoencoders, your reconstruction um, is not super good as well, right? So what happens here when you use these overparameterized autoencoders? So our intuition, and we don't have a proof yet, came from, you know, these autoencoders being attractive to the training examples. So we were hoping that instead of just being attractive to zero dimensional things like points, um, this would also hold for lines um, so that, you know, the things will become more aligned if they're actually similar to each other. And it's pretty nice that that's exactly what happens. Okay, you see that there is, you know, these things are much more aligned, right? It's either one or minus one, meaning that they're actually aligned as lines. And of course you get perfect reconstruction because we are over parameterized. So, you know, the training examples will certainly be matched to each other. And as we saw, you know, you're still close to the identity map. So you actually will generalize well also on other um, unseen examples. Um, and in fact, the alignment is similar to PCA. Just when you do PCA, of course, you get rid of all the information. Um, and you'll see the same thing here. I'm showing it to you just for two different cell types. But it's the same thing also if you look at all cell types that are available in CMAP. Okay, so this intuition can really help you to, you know, try to actually get an, a latent space where you can transport the effect of one drug from one cell type to another cell type, just by it being more, um, more aligned or more contracted. And with that, let me end. I mean, we do have a list of drugs, um, which, and now I should also say how we use the graphical models. So this is a nice way of validating, right, that once you get out the list of drugs, that these drugs, if you look at the regulatory network, you see where, you know, which genes um, these drugs are targeting, for example, um, then you can see that, you know, a drug is, of course, only effective if it's upstream from the differentially expressed genes in a disease, right? Um, so it has to be upstream from it. So if you learn, so what we did is for all these drugs that we have here in the end, we did learn these gene regulatory networks and, you know, ordered them by, you know, how many of the differentially expressed genes in the disease are actually downstream from the targets of the drug. Um, and that's how um, we got to this particular uh, RIPK1 protein or, you know, which is a target of, um, of particular um, different kinds of drugs that we have listed here. But I think this is a really interesting, it's kind of nice that this is the one that came out that is the most upstream to the differentially expressed genes in this disease. It's changing its role with aging, which is of course something that we know that this disease is um, highly age dependent. And, and this is something we didn't put into um, our analysis as a constraint that actually directly binds to SARS-CoV-2 proteins.
Okay, so these are the drugs that now we're actually um, testing also experimentally. So I think it's nice that you can use this overparameterization to actually come up with better ways of, you know, trying to predict the effect of a drug on different cell types. Okay, and with that, I'll end. Um, so I hope I was able to show you that we developed uh, theoretical and algorithmic frameworks for integrating and translating um, between observational and interventional data uh, using causality and autoencoders. And I'm really excited about autoencoders. I think they're extremely useful for data integration and translation, um, but also, of course, for studying you know, properties of neural networks, I hope, as you saw. Um, they're just easier because they map from RD to RD, right? So that makes it much, much easier. Um, the self regularization I'm putting here again, I hope I was able to explain what I mean by that. Um, this also provides a new and biologically plausible mechanism for associative memory, which is just given by iteration. Um, of course, I didn't talk about this, but you know, um, that you can recover training examples just by iterating from noise is a huge privacy concern. It does mean that, you know, you maybe don't want to share trained neural networks between different hospitals, for example, um, because I would be able to figure out what the training examples were. Um, so these are certainly things that require a bit more analysis. And there are many, many open problems. I refer to this one here that we would really like to learn the metric that is learned by an autoencoder in a latent space. You know, what are these um, basins of attraction? Um, we want to get similar results for classification, definition of generalization, I already mentioned, et cetera. Okay, so I would like to thank, um, you know, this work wouldn't have been possible without a really, really amazing group of people. In particular, um, the work I talked about um, was Adit's work um, on the autoencoders on the theoretical properties. Um, and then on all the applications of these autoencoders, that was um, Karen's work, um, you know, over time and between different data modalities. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 was actually a big um, project that we all put together in terms of like combining all of the different things um, that we're doing in our lab. And on the causality side, again, uh, we have many different people working on it. Um, with Raj, um, Karen's work, Chandler's work, a lot of the, the if you're using the, um, the Python package, um, Chandler put together a really, really nice and I think very intuitive um, package here. Um, so this, and of course, then a lot of funding as well. Okay, and so thank you very much for your um, attention and I'll take any questions that you might still have. Thank you very much, Caroline. Now thank is you, Carson. This, this was a great overview over all the different things that you can do with uh, both graphical models and autoencoders in, in, in computational biology. So we have uh, now time for a few questions. Is there one fr from inside the network? I don't see a raised hand, but if you are thinking of a question, then, then uh, do so now and then raise your hand. And in the meanwhile, we go to the Slido questions. Let me just order them chronologically within the talk. So there's one about the first part, which says, exciting topics, could you briefly comment on, on how you achieve or improve scalability for the DAX? This is question one. Um, yeah, how do you improve scalability? I mean, uh, you know, it is empty hard. So in that case, um, you know, it all has different kinds of assumptions. Um, then it depends on how you are encoding these kinds of things. So I don't think there are any good ways or not good ways of improving scalability other than, you know, yes, we work over a different space. So it's a smaller search space. Maybe that's one thing that I can answer. So permutations is a smaller search space than graphs. Um, so that's one way of improving um, scalability. But I think also other algorithms now scale, right? GSP, I mean, scales very, very well, the search over graphs. I mean, nowadays people have put in a lot of effort. So they will also scale. I'm not saying that these al the algorithm we have scales better than others. Others have put in much more work in terms of scaling them up to large graphs. So um, in particular, the greedy, um, the GS, really equivalent search, search over graph scales to huge, huge networks. So that's still the fastest one. Um, and then the, is this due to improvements of, of the implementation or due to um, like simplifications of the optimization problem that are being made or uh, like yeah. what's the major strategy that there? So greedy equivalent search has been around for a long time. So that's really based on the, the implementation. 
Also, PC algorithm has been a lot around for a long time. That's all due to the implementation. So they've put in a lot of work. Ours, we haven't put in any work yet in terms of implementation. That's why we're so happy that already now, just because it's a smaller search space, probably, right? Um, it already, if you, I mean, it's not our work to compare all of the speeds. That's why I'm so happy. It's someone else who got our algorithms actually to work just out of the Python package. It scales exactly the same way if you go to like 100,000 nodes. Um, so yeah, but we haven't put in any effort yet in actually really making it scale well. Good, thank you. Um, then there is a question about the second part, I think. Are there with depth intuitions, uh, no, are these with and depth intuitions applicable to other types of architectures than CNNs? Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, very good. So this is not just CNNs. This is certainly a, con a fully connected networks, um, and in particular, the kinds of things that I'm showing you there on those plots. So that was with fully connected networks. Um, with uh, convolutional neural networks, you only get to see this after a certain depth, right? So, so if, I mean, so, okay, I didn't go into that, but convolutional networks, it, because if you look at the matrices, right, you'll have some zeros in there. So to memorize a vector, you already need to at least multiply, have as many layers so that you don't have any zeros anymore when you're multiplying up your matrices because otherwise you cannot memorize a vector. So all of these plots will happen as well for convolutional ones after a certain depth. Um, so we have it for fully connected for convolutional. So those are the two that we analyzed um, in this setting. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah. Now there's a question from inside the network, Giovanni Bisona. Please go ahead, Joe. Hi, hello. Thank you for the talk. It was really amazing. So the question that I have, I might have missed a point, but it was more of a general discussion. So often Perfect. autoencoders are not really treated as generative models. Um, so they do so for variants like variational autoencoders, but you seem to be analyzing their properties in that regard um, anyway. Was that a consideration or an obstacle that you considered during your analysis? Yeah, so, okay, so the, many of these things just work for variation. I just didn't um, differentiate between them. So yes, certainly this is variational autoencoders um, when I'm showing you things. Whenever there are images, it's variational autoencoders um, so that you can actually move around easier. Yes. And um, can I ask a follow-up question quickly on that? Um, often the reconstruction quality of variational autoencoders is a bit blurry in the case of images. Have yeah. you found that to be true and an issue or was that still a sufficient quality to allow you to get good results in your analysis? Yeah, so for us it's um, good enough results, um, yes. And also here, I mean, you can play around with it. Nowadays you can get autoencoders to actually give out quite good images, right, where people will be very, very happy with them. Um, so this is maybe changing a bit, right, going from GANs to actually seeing that autoencoders can do actually really, really well. Um, so for us here, um, this was good enough in the, in the sense that the kinds of features that we care about, about the heterochromatine and how it packs, etc., um, you can actually get that to be very, very good. Again, if you over-parameterize it more, then of course um, your images will also become less blurry. Um, and that's another insight that you can really play around with that. Um, and I think that's super important to do. Yeah. So that also helps a lot there. Um, in particular, you see here that um, when we do it, right, um, you know, if you have an over-parameterized autoencoder, then obviously your, your reconstruction loss will actually be zero, right? So um, your images are not going to be blurry. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. We have another question by Lucas uh, Miranda. Lucas, please. Thank you very much, Carsten, and thank you, Caroline, for the talk. It was very inspiring. Uh, following up on Giovanni on the variational autoencoders, uh, I wanted to bring back a problem that I've been facing while using them, uh, which is if I over-parameterize the latent space, uh, many of the dimensions collapse, and uh, they, after training, remain just the same than the, uh, than the prior. And I wanted to ask you if you faced that problem and if you found any way uh, around it. Yeah. So these things happen and this is a lot of uh, parameter tuning, right? Which everyone will have to do in terms of these mode collapses. Um, yeah, so, so I think it's still a lot of engineering, right? So this is easier um, if you get rid of all of this uh, variational part. Um, so you could also just try to, to, uh, to see what happens. I mean, it depends on your application. I just don't know what, what you want to do downstream with it. Um, so depending on that, right? So here, for example, we actually don't use um, anything like that. We also don't use it. We actually just use a fully connected network. Um, so it really depends on what you want to do downstream, but you can, of course, just 
try to completely change your architecture. Use something much simpler where maybe you can actually analyze these things better. But otherwise, yes, it is still a whole lot of um, parameter tuning. I'm not going to hide that. Um, yeah, so yeah, but just try. I mean, we, we do now a lot of things on, on fully connected networks. Um, because they actually work quite well for the downstream analysis as well, as long as it's very over parameterized. Thank you very much. In fact, I would have a question, um, Caroline, to, to conclude here the question and answer session. You showed these impressive applications of autoencoders. Have you also encountered applications where they did not work? Maybe where the sample size is still too small. I mean, this is quite common. In fact, in, in once you move to clinical applications, that the sample size is not um, the same as in molecular data sets. So have you also like examples of where this does not work yet or not work as you would um, expect when looking at these other successes? So for us, it has really worked and actually the sample sizes are not big. Um, but mm -hmm. since I'm showing you all of the advantages of over parameterization, you know, this is something that from our work, we already knew that, you know, sometimes you actually want to throw away data. I mean, I know it sounds really crazy, but in order, if you're not able to get your, your network based on computational costs to be as over parameterized as you would want it, it actually makes sense to throw away data. And there has just recently been a paper which actually shows exactly that, right? So it's, it's certainly not, I mean, now seeing this, right, it's certainly not a disadvantage. Of course, you need some data to be able to at least get a bit of an intuition of what the manifold is that you're trying to learn, but it's not the case that you need huge, huge, huge amounts of data. <laughs> Here we, we have like maybe a thousand, uh, you know, different kinds of samples, but not, you know, the standard, whatever, many thousands uh, samples. So I think there one needs to like kind of rethink these things of what over parameterization, what this actually shows you, right? In terms of over parameterization, it does mean that at some point you may actually need to throw away data um, to get better results. Um, yeah, so it does sound counterintuitive, but you know, this is the case now, now that we understand this better, right? There's all this double descent curves, Misha Belkin's work, etc. So I think there is a rethinking happening. Good, thank you very much. And thank you for this uh, great talk. Um, thank you very much. And for joining our network and our summer school here.